In the world of air crash investigation, some of the most crucial pieces of evidence can be found inside an airplane's flight recorders. Having a recording from onboard an aircraft ready to be retrieved to tell the events of an ill-fated flight is invaluable to any investigation. They can tell investigators some remarkable things, and sometimes investigators can get a whole lot more than they bargained for, and we'll be talking about one such case today. When you think of the term flight recorder, two objects may come to mind. There is the flight data recorder, which records various parameters and technical data about a flight. And then there's the cockpit voice recorder, which does exactly what it sounds like. One or more microphones in the flight deck recording the conversations of the pilots. Together, these two items, though they are known colloquially as black boxes, they are typically coated in bright orange, done so to stand out amongst plane wreckage or at the bottom of the sea. As you'd expect, therefore, given the sensitive nature of the voice recorder's content, these aren't always released to the public, unlike, say, accident reports or photographs. Sometimes they are, for various reasons, if it is in the public interest. Some countries have been known to release these recordings more liberally than others, and in other cases, the recordings themselves are withheld, but they are transcribed. Today, though, we are going to look into the case of Braniff International Airways Flight 352. This is a rather rare case of an air accident, where though the disaster took place 55 years ago, and for almost all of that time the cockpit voice recording was kept from the public, just two months ago, at time of recording this video, it surfaced. Though the recording was withheld, I'd say, having looked into it, I'd describe it more as lost. In remarkable circumstances, it was only rediscovered recently and released to the public. And there is a story there which we'll get into later. This is one of the oldest cockpit voice recordings to ever surface from a crash. The recording sheds further light into that flight deck of 55 years ago. What we are about to unearth and break down here today are the events leading up to a fatal catastrophe that could so easily have been avoided. And with the help of this recording, We'll piece together why. Friday, May 3rd, 1968, Houston, Texas, mid afternoon. A Braniff International Airways aircraft has just landed at Houston's William Hobby Airport, arriving from Dallas. The plane in question is a Lockheed L 188 Electra. The Electra, for those not in the know, is now an aircraft that is pretty much confined to the history books. The Electra was a four-engine turboprop that first took to the skies in the late 1950s. In a time when piston prop liners were facing their demise, newer jet and turboprop planes were set to take their place. The Electra was a plane that was popular with the pilots who flew it. It was a reliable machine that was faster than many of the planes that came before it, especially those old prop liners. It even featured a larger cargo compartment and additional safety features. However, there weren't that many Lockheed L-188 Electras built. It didn't sell very well. It didn't help that a number of fatal incidents with the things sort of gave it a negative reputation, and the aircraft only had a four-year production run between 1957 and 1961, with a total of 170 Electras built. Though it was a commercial failure, still it was a reliable plane for what it was worth. In total, Braniff operated 11 of these planes. Captain John Phillips was hired by Braniff shortly after the end of World War II in January 1946. He wasn't always a pilot at the airline, he had spent many years working his way up through the company, but began flying in the 1960s. He first began to pilot the Lockheed Electra in 1964. However, as an ambitious pilot, he set his sights on the new jets of the day. He had actually passed his training to fly the brand new Boeing 727 in 1967, but was moved back over to the Electra on May 2nd, 1968, which you'll note was actually the day before the accident that would take his life. Over the course of his piloting career, he had achieved just shy of 11,000 flight hours. Captain Phillips was not flying the plane alone. The Electra requires three people to fly. The younger first officer, 32-year-old John Foster, 
had only been with Braniff for just under two years. Unlike his captain, he was still new to the plane with just 143 hours logged in the aircraft. A second officer fulfilling a flight engineer role was occupying the third position in the cockpit, 28-year-old Donald Crossland. He was the least experienced member of the flight crew with just 1,000 total hours logged, most of which was as flight engineer on this plane. The three men were commanding the plane registered as November 9707 Charlie, a 1959 built Electra that was delivered to Braniff that year. By the time of the accident, it had accumulated around 21,000 flight hours and had just been in for a checkup less than one week previously. Within the maintenance records of the plane, it was noted that on multiple occasions, the aircraft needed to be checked due to periods of flying into severe turbulence. The inspections that were carried out on the plane on those occasions were simple visual inspections with no needed scrutiny for alignment or symmetry of the plane. Maintenance teams signed off on the aircraft and it continued to fly without incident. Captain Phillips and his team would be flying the ill-fated aircraft as Braniff International Airways Flight 352, Houston to Memphis via Dallas, Tulsa, Portsmouth, and Little Rock. Almost like a small tour of the South. It was nearly a full flight, with 80 passengers filling the seats in the cabin. A further two flight attendants plus the pilots brought the total number of people traveling that day to 85. There was, however, an additional body on board. Ground handlers at Houston that afternoon had loaded a coffin into the plane's cargo compartment. Flight 352 was to transport the body of a woman who had recently died of cancer. She was being transported to Tulsa where their family was to pick them up. Following a short delay on the ground due to being held for other traffic, Flight 352 took off from Houston at 11 minutes past 4 in the afternoon. The leg to Dallas is only a short flight of less than one hour. At that time, weather records on the day in Houston showed that it had been a rather cloudy day there. There were some breaks in the cloud and it looked as if the sky was about to clear up. The same couldn't really be said for where the plane was heading, but we'll get to that. As expected, the pilots took the plane north heading to Dallas. In communication with air traffic control, the pilots were cleared to bring the aircraft up to its cruising altitude of 20,000 feet. Flight 352 leveled off having reached this altitude at 4.30. The plane has been in the air for pretty much 20 minutes, and it was within the next 5 to 7 minutes that things would begin to go very wrong. So there is one aspect of this flight that so far I have neglected to properly mention. It is time we delve into it. We need to understand the weather situation, because it was a whole lot more complicated than just cloudy. The pilots of Flight 352 were about to encounter a violent thunderstorm, leading into perhaps one of the most shocking air disasters I think we've ever talked about. So what was the Texas sky itself doing that day? Well, let's try to familiarize ourselves with the meteorology of the matter. In meteorology, Texas is rather fascinating. This whole region of the Americas is pretty much at the crossroads of a number of different climate zones. And we can even see that when we look at satellite imagery of Texas. In the western side of the state, sort of towards the border with Mexico, we get a very hot, dry, and arid climate. As we head out west into the extremities of the state, sort of towards that pointy bit, we get to a more desert-like climate. But swinging back over to the other side of the state, in contrast to the drier western side, we have a huge humid region, which is exacerbated by the Gulf of Mexico to the south. Prevailing winds coming up from the Gulf brings all of that humid air in from the sea. And this is a rather huge region that spans the entirety of the American South, all the way down to Florida. What we have got here is what we call a humid subtropical climate. Now we hear this word a lot when we talk about the weather, but what does it actually mean? When we say that weather is humid, we are basically referring to how much water is in the air. That being water that has evaporated from the sea in this case and risen into the sky. Now you probably didn't need me to tell you this, but the point is that Texas gets its high humidity, its high moisture content in the air, its saturated air from the Gulf of Mexico, and sort of comes up from the south. Now that's all well and good, but not only do you have the hot, dry climate on the other side of the state, but you also have a tendency for dry, cooler air to be brought down from the north. 
It's sometimes the case that cold fronts can move in from Canada and make their way down here. Now, what is fascinating is that the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration has actually archived a whole bunch of weather maps from that week in 1968, giving us further data and insight into what was happening in the United States that week in terms of the weather. We know the accident in question occurred on the Friday, which was May 3rd. But if we back up to the Monday, which was April 29th, we can see the beginning of that scenario, a cold front moving in from the north in Canada. Early in the week, it was attached to what we call an occluded front. You can think of that kind of like overlapping parcels of warm and cold air. This would fade as the week progressed, resulting in a long cold front spanning hundreds of miles. The weather front moved southeast as the week progressed, reaching the Iowa-Nebraska region by Thursday and continuing on towards Texas into the Friday. I was able to cross-reference the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration's weather reports with the meteorological findings in the accident report. By this time, the cold front spanned from central Texas all the way up to Illinois in the Midwest. So what have we got here? A mass of cooler air swooping in from the north, but the winds were also coming from the south that day in Texas, bringing in that warmer, humid air. So what happens when they mingle, which happened to be the case on May 3rd, 1968? Thunderstorm formation is very complex, so today we'll be keeping this more on the simpler side. For a thunderstorm to form, three things are required. Lift, moisture, and an unstable atmosphere that can come from the meeting of systems of high and low pressure, or even latent heat. Warm air rising and condensing in this case causes clouds to form. That draft of warm air rising is called the updraft. Warm air is less dense than cooler air, so it rises. It will bring the warm and humid air in this case upward. The updraft allows a cloud to grow. Now in a hot, humid region like that area in Texas with nothing to really stop the process, the environment here doesn't just allow for the formation of small puffy clouds. Over time, as the building storm draws up more warm, humid air, these towering clouds can develop that extend tens of thousands of feet up potentially even reaching that critical boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere. That even has its own name, we call it the tropopause. By which point the cloud spreads out at the top and we get that beautiful anvil at the peak of the storm cloud. Powerful updrafts can also cause an overflowing top sort of breaking that boundary. What we have here is the iconic cumulonimbus cloud. When a cloud fills with water, it darkens, and we get those intimidating, darker, black clouds. Cold air at the top of the cloud is heavier and begins to sink, and with it, it brings all of that moisture down. We call this the downdraft, so there is this convective system of warm and cool air inside of the cloud. More water saturated in that space allows the actual physical water droplets to grow in size, even attaching themselves to tiny dust particles, and once they are too heavy, they fall, and we've come to know that as rain. The downdraft can also bring winds, snow, possibly hail, and if the conditions are right, tornadoes. But that is a whole other discussion for another time. In the case of a cumulonimbus, precipitation can be rather heavy. It's stottendun, as we say where I'm from. The cycle of convection inside these large clouds means excessive turbulence for aircraft. We have a storm that pilots generally like to avoid. The aviation meteorology textbook I used in flying school even says, and I quote, intentionally flying into a cumulonimbus cloud would be extremely foolhardy. Thunderstorms and rain showers come in all manner of shapes and sizes, but what we have here in the case of May 3rd, 1968 over Texas is a long strand of stormy weather building across the cold fronts. Texans would have looked up into the sky that day and have seen a long front of towering storm clouds. We call this a quasi-linear convective system, otherwise known more commonly amongst meteorologists as a squall line. The squall storm made its way southeast that day over the Dallas region. So what we need to know here, if we look at the flight path of Flight 352, is that by the time the pilots encountered the storm, it had moved to about here. Now, according to the accident report, by this point, the storm spanned from central Texas all the way through, think of it cutting across the flight path, with some breaks in the weather, but largely it extended all the way through to Tennessee. Even after the accident, the storm continued further south. 
That's all I have on the transcript, so this concludes the weather report from me today. Now that we have established how the sky was behaving, we must now return to the flight itself. Or rather, we need to gain insight as to whether or not the pilots really understood what stood between them and their destination. Before the plane left Dallas earlier that day, the skies were much different. When they performed the flight to Houston, there wasn't much of a concern for thunderstorms. This all began to change around 3 p.m. whilst the plane was on the ground at Hobby Airport. At 3 p.m., a weather station in Waco reported the presence of thunderstorm clouds northwest of their position. The storm was moving in. One hour later, they reported the same thing. At 4.35, the same Waco weather station made this report. Broken clouds at 3,500, additional overcast layers, visibility of 15 miles, rain showers, and thunderstorms. They made this observation to the west of where Flight 352 would fly. Additional stations in Dallas and Tyler reported a similar story from their respective positions. As the afternoon went on, lightning was also reported. The issue, though, is that the accident plane was already out and was preparing to return. But there was that stormy barrier forming between them. In fact, it was coming towards them. After the accident, Galveston would also report thunderstorms. So, were they warned ahead of time? Whilst in Houston, there were reports and indications of building storms, and the pilots were given a copy of the relevant information. Investigators would later conclude that satisfactory information had been issued here. Although it needs to be mentioned that the accident report also says that there was no evidence to suggest that a formal weather briefing took place. However, as the pilots flew down to Houston several hours previously with no storms in the region, they may have been led to thinking whilst looking over the reports before they took off again that it wasn't as bad as it seemed. By 4.30 that afternoon, as Flight 352 was en route, the storm was in full effect. Air traffic, though it was still coming and going from Dallas, air traffic controllers and other pilots were navigating and deviating through the storm via a break in the weather that was to the east of Flight 352's position. Now, we have reached possibly the most critical point in this disaster's chain of events. It was deemed by the pilots using their own observations and with their onboard weather radar that there was an opening in the west. What you are about to hear is the cockpit voice recording of this flight that was released in April of 2023. The recording has been edited, but what we have here is around five minutes of the cockpit voice recording that begins from around 4.35 that afternoon, with some splices in between leading up to the disaster at 4.47. This was when the pilots caught a glimpse of the squall thunderstorm and immediately saw it necessary to deviate their course. If you wish to not to listen to this, timestamps will be provided. What's that? Come on, it's on. 60 miles in front of us. Not a Houston Center burn F-352, a few miles up the road, uh, we'd like to TVA to the west, looks like there's something in front of us. Roger, one moment. Sure. Well, they were back in. Yeah. They were on the south. Yeah, well, they're going to be on the south. Yeah, they're going to be on the south. And, uh, 352, uh, we'd like to descend to 15,000 if we can get a place. Yeah, I'm not going to get a place. Right on 352, contact forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fort Worth Center, burn at 352, requesting 15,000 and requesting deviation to the west. Burn at 352, Fort Worth, because deviation east, of course, uh, all the aircraft are deviating at that way at the present time. Over. The controller the first officer began conversing with here was a man by the name of Glenn Wilson. I'd like you to make a mental note of this name. You'll want to remember it for later. The fact now needs to be laid out. The pilots' observations were wrong. They thought an area to the west was clear and safe. It, in fact, was not. The controller would go on record himself to say that no other planes had made their way through there during this time. There were no confirming reports the area was safe, but to the pilots, it appeared so, so they went with it. 
Now, obviously, as the pilots were looking out of their window, they were using their own observations, but may have had a false sense of security from their onboard weather radar. So, let's talk a little bit about that. The Lockheed L-188 Electra they were flying did have a weather radar installed. However, the technology of the 1960s was limited. They did not have the sophisticated, colorful weather displays that pilots are accustomed to today. Weather radars work with just that, a radar. In fact, weather radar was birthed and developed from a quirk in the technology. Radar operators of the old days sometimes caught additional unexpected signals on their displays that were reflected back to their position. Not from an airplane or other large object, but rather from weather. So many early weather radars on planes used this exploit and had storm data reflected back to their position. It was grainy and often in black and white, with the white areas indicating storm intensity. It is the belief of investigators in this case that the radar worked as intended. However, the separations of storm cells may have been interpreted by the pilots as a clearer, lighter area that may have been safe to fly through. It wasn't, it was just part of a large violent storm. Contributing to this false sense of security, the aircraft's radar was actually tilted about 8 degrees up, giving, in this case, a false and misleading interpretation of the storm. But there was one more problem with what the pilots may have been seeing on their radar, but we'll come back to that in time. On the controller's end, they had a different interpretation of the weather. They were located at a stationary point on the ground and also had on hand reports from other pilots, which is something that will become apparent on the recording. As we previously established, what was happening at this time was pilots were deviating through the known opening in the east, not the west. We even just heard it on the recording. The Fort Worth center controller suggested a deviation to the east because all the other planes were going that way. It's as if that to everyone else, this area to the west was at that time a danger. However, the pilots of Flight 352 were led to believe they could do it. But let's continue with the recording. Uh, 352, does it look better on our scope here? It looks like to the, looks just a little bit to the west to do us real fine. 352, deviation west of course is approved. Now stand by on the altitude change and uh, squawk by the ad over. As you just heard, the controller cleared Flight 352 to go west, even after he suggested a route through to the east. The pilots with this clearance executed a small left turn and deviated west of their flight path. They would soon begin descending. As we continue with this recording, you're about to hear Captain Phillips make a passenger announcement over the PA. We let the segment of the recording play out as it does give a bit of insight into what he was actually seeing and his manner of nonchalantly informing his passengers of such weather, at least to me, suggests he probably didn't think this weather was as bad as it actually was. Man at 352, radar contract, level lower altitude shortly. Okay, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Phillips. We're cruising at 20,000 feet. Our ground speed this altitude is 350 miles an hour. The uh, weather at Dallas, on the last sequence they were giving, is 3,000 scouted, 10,000 scattered, high broken, visibility is 6 miles with haze and smoke, the temperature is 82 degrees, wind is out of the southeast at 8. At this present speed, we expect to arrive Dallas schedule, schedule been in uh, 4.58. Uh, directly ahead, we have a little line of thunder showers. Uh, we're going to deviate a little bit to the west. This might require two or three more minutes, but I think it'll be much more smooth and comfortable. It's been a pleasure having you all on board today. I hope you have a very pleasant day in Dallas, the ones uh, who are planning in Dallas. Since uh, February the 1st, uh, Brown International has been the number one airline on time. We hope to maintain that record. In April, we had uh, almost 96% on time, which is leading the industry still. Anytime you have any comments or suggestions that might, uh, in your opinion, make this better airline, let us know. Thank you very much for your patronage. Those of you who are continuing past Dallas will be departing Dallas, Bartosa, 
352, we're out at flight level 200 for 14,000. 352 The pilots of Flight 352 have just flown into the beginning of the storm that would ultimately take their lives. As it may well have been the case that the plane was approaching the tops of the storms, and with the weather radar tilted into a slight up position, the real scope of the storm may have been obscured, but it was about to reveal itself over the next two minutes. You'll hear as the controller gets on frequency once again for a traffic advisory, mentioning another Braniff plane that was heading out east. Roger, Braniff 352, you got company traffic at 10 o'clock, 8 miles, northeast bound at 13,000. Wake oil altimeter is 2976. And he's deviating east, of course. 362, Roger. Uh, we don't have him in sight yet. Uh, he's deviating east, of course. Oh, there he is. That's a clock. Damn gun. That's a clock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're ready to start the day. Now, Fort Worth, burn at 52, requesting low altitude, please. Uh, run at 352, uh, I'm unable right now. Your company traffic's right under you. Just as soon as you're clear of him, I'll uh, have something lower. What's your you heading now? Uh, 352, we're turning over to, uh, heading, uh, 340 degrees now. I'd like to remind you at this time. Run at 352, right here. Well, I'm going to be back with you, Brandon 352, descending to 9,000, over. 352, descending to 5,000. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Brandon 352, do you indicate the area you're going into there now as being, uh, uh, fairly clear, or do you see opening through it? Uh, 352, uh, it's not clear, uh, but we think we see an opening through it. We must pause here. The captain has just gone on record to ask if there have been any reports of hail. Remember how earlier we were talking about how the pilots may have had that false sense of security with the weather radar? Though weather radars today can easily detect hailstorms, taking a bit of a deeper dive into the accident report. Comments from investigators give further insight into the weather radar technology of the day and its limitations. Frozen precipitation such as hail, ice, and snow is typically less reflective than something like rain, which is highly reflective and could more accurately be displayed on the pilot's radar. In the 1960s, on board airplanes, these early weather radars can have their radio signals interrupted by hail, which could lead to a misleading weather radar display, perhaps influencing the pilot's decision to fly west instead of east. Multiple reports indicated, and even when coupled with the pilot's own comments, Flight 352 had flown into a hailstorm. Investigators were of the opinion that the pilots should have heeded the warnings from not just the air traffic controller, but also the fact that another plane from their own airline was changing course to avoid the weather they had just flown into. We are about to play out the ending of the recording. Very quickly, the atmosphere in the cockpit will change, and it is rather unsettling. For example, you will hear the sounds consistent with an in-flight breakup. The pilots will quickly realize their mistake, and they knew they messed up here, and that will become apparent on the recording. Knowing things were bad, they'd attempt a corrective maneuver to get themselves out of it. If you wish to skip hearing the end of this, please use the timestamp provided. Uh, 352, do you have any reports of hail in this area? 
No, you're the closest one that's ever come to it yet. Uh, I haven't been able to get anybody to... Well, I haven't tried, really, to get anybody to go through it. They've all deviated around to the east. Oh, okay. So what happened here? You heard yourself just how quickly things changed. In a matter of seconds upon entering the storm, the plane suffered a catastrophic structural failure and broke apart in flight. Flight 352 was descending. At that point of disaster, they had reached around 10,000 feet. We know that as a method of getting themselves out of the storm, they requested a 180 degree turn. The controller said yes, and the pilots began to bank the plane. This was actually against their own pilot training at Braniff. In scenarios of excessive turbulence and stormy weather, the pilots were supposed to keep flying straight and maintain a level attitude, as best they could anyway. Instead, they chose to turn. So here's what happened. Captain Phillips began banking his Electra to the right. Gusts of wind and building turbulence induced by the violent nature of these storm clouds began to bounce the plane around. This, for a moment, ripped control of the plane away from the captain's grasp, and very quickly the aircraft overbanked beyond 90 degrees to the right, into a region calculated by investigators to have been around 110 degrees of bank, the plane almost inverting, the nose dropping roughly negative 40 degrees. The plane picked up excessive airspeed as its altitude began to plummet. Excessive loads were exhorted on the plane, the aircraft was far beyond its structural limits, with significant stress accumulating in the right wing. To counter this excessive bank, the captain attempts to level his wings and recover the aircraft. As he did so, both wings began to flex. The left wing, too, was under significant stress. The inside section and the tip of the right wing, however, were flexed to their breaking points. Cracks and fractures spread from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the wing. At that moment of disaster, the right wing failed and separated from the rest of the ill-fated plane. The fuel tanks were ruptured, resulting in what eyewitnesses best described as a fireball. It consumed the plane as it began its final descent to the ground. The moment this occurred, the pilots and everyone on board never stood a chance. Physics was now working against them. The right horizontal stabilizer was the next component to fail. Soot later found on the stabilizer suggest it had been soaked in the jet fuel now pouring out of the plane. As the right stabilizer separated, it struck the tail fin, made evident by the paint markings later found on the tail, although the tail stayed attached to the plane. Seconds later, Braniff Flight 352 crashed into the Texas countryside. The plane had crashed very near, just east of the town of Dawson, south of Dallas, northeast of Waco. The plane came down on rural farmland, destroying a barn in the process. Those on the ground and residents in Dawson quickly arrived at the scene. Now when discussing this horrifying disaster, the story simply is not complete without mentioning how the small town of Dawson, Texas responded to it. In what was a truly awful day, the small community here collectively pulled together to assist in the aftermath. For example, in Dawson that day, a group of individuals who worked at the local telecommunications company were out on strike. Following the disaster, they immediately cancelled their picket, put down their signs, and went back to work to manage the telephone lines. As the magnitude of the disaster began to set in for many residents of Dawson, many ran home. You have to remember Dawson is very small, so many ran home, picked up blankets, quilts, 
pillows and other supplies from their own homes and brought them to the crash site to hold human remains and personal items. Others helped by moving and installing emergency equipment, and still others brought food for rescue workers, medics, and investigators. The efforts of those at the crash site that day were under difficult conditions. Hail and heavy rains made it difficult for them to do their jobs. Even the local school pitched in to help. Their gym was converted into a temporary morgue, where for two days, rescue workers would bring human remains. Unfortunately, it was established that all 85 passengers and crew on board Flight 352 had died. There were no survivors. The only body that was found to be intact was of the passenger who was already deceased, protected by their coffin in the cargo compartment. The violent nature of how this plane crashed cannot be overstated. The bodies and remains of the victims were left unrecognizable. Though many relatives insisted on seeing their loved ones, investigators and morticians saw it was best to convince them otherwise. The crash of Braniff Flight 352 was now in the hands of investigators at the National Transportation Safety Board. It was established by investigators early on that there was some form of in-flight breakup, clearly indicated by the presence of a larger debris field. Analysis of the wreckage and the whereabouts of various pieces of the plane gave investigators insight into how the plane broke apart and where failure occurred, narrowing it down to the right wing being the source of the in-flight breakup. Earlier, we talked about that phase of the flight as the plane was becoming overstressed. This was one area that was unclear at first to investigators. Reports from eyewitnesses suggested that a lightning strike on the plane may have been at fault. However, though lightning was believed to have occurred then, this was merely coincidental and lightning was not a factor. Investigators were able to track down the plane's flight recorders. The investigation was able to extract the recordings, including the cockpit voice recording we've just listened to. The recording was invaluable for the investigation. It depicted the story we've told today, of the pilots electing to fly through a region of severe weather. This was a region of the sky that was known to be dangerous, but still, they attempted to go through it. The storm was so intense it tore the plane apart and everyone died. Investigators were able to deliver the findings we went over today in their final report that was released just over one year later. The accident really highlighted how dangerous the skies can be when flying around thunderstorms. The investigation made a number of recommendations, including the call for additional structural checks of the Lockheed Electra. Perhaps one of the key recommendations here was that thunderstorms should now be avoided with a clearance of 20 miles. Onboard weather radars, were now to be used as a storm avoidance instrument rather than a tool to help pilots navigate them. For the town of Dawson, what happened that day became an integral part of that community's history. A small memorial and plaque has been set up and the site has now become a small children's playground. Services are still conducted to remember those who lost their lives 55 years ago. This would be where the story ends, but we're not done here. To go back to what was said in the beginning of this video, there is a story related to this plane's cockpit voice recording. So what actually happened to it? Well, on the Electra, the recordings from the cockpit microphones were recorded onto a four-track tape within the black box itself. The investigation did not release it to the public. Instead, it was to be archived. It should have been archived and filed away somewhere with the National Transportation Safety Board. Evidently, though, that's not what appears to have happened here. During the investigation, the NTSB didn't have any such equipment on site to listen to the cockpit voice recording. So they looked locally in Dallas to find anyone who had the suitable equipment. They found help in the form of a local recording studio named Sellers Studios. The studio was typically frequented by local musicians and bands, so it was certainly unusual for them to work with investigators on the CVR. When the NTSB concluded their investigation, the CVR, or at least one copy of the tape, remained in Texas. Seller Studios archived the tape themselves. It stayed with them in their possession for many years, locked away. The recording studio, however, went out of business in 1982. 
Along with it, its entire archive remained dormant and needed to be moved elsewhere. In 2023, a local television and radio presenter discovered this large collection of tapes inside a Texas barn. Mixed in amongst the many demo recordings of local bands over the years was the cockpit voice recording of Braniff International Flight 352. This truly was an incredible find. They contacted a local Texas man by the name of David Wilson. David here was the son of Glenn Wilson, the air traffic controller who spoke to the ill-fated flight that day. David Wilson studied Flight 352 after discovering his father's role in the event. With the tape in his possession, he handed it over to his brother, Steve Wilson, who was able to extract the recording and have it remastered. And that was the recording you heard today. On April 27, 2023, it was delivered to the public through the local newspaper and media outlet, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. The recording was even uploaded straight to YouTube. It's a rather incredible story of media preservation, albeit more on the macabre side. And that is where our story ends today. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed so that you won't miss the next one. This video though has taken the longest time to make out of any video I think I've ever done. I'm very happy with how it's turned out as there was tons to go over here. I do hope you liked the weather report segment. That was an idea I've had for quite some time. Thought it would be worth a try to have a go at a different style of video to what I usually do. If people like it, then maybe it could be a more regular feature for weather situations, but we'll see. Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Speaking of weather, that segment would not have been possible if it wasn't for a good friend of the show, Ali or Porcelain Girl on Twitter, who helped me out immensely with writing that segment. Big thanks to her. Additionally, because she also pledged on Patreon this week, which segues nicely into that time where I must take a moment to thank and appreciate my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, a massive, massive thanks to you. So we've got a couple more shoutouts to do today. Big special thanks go out to Ansel Woods and Han Raizu Hidori. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Shout out to those two who both pledged at the highest tiers this past fortnight. What legends. If you yourself would like to support the channel further, you can always join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below, along with my social media. All patrons get early access to all new videos, two days before they go out publicly on YouTube. That is all for me today. Thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you next time. Goodbye. Why am I waving? Why I always do that?